pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. The mic. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Terrell Green, and I am the Scoutmaster for Troop 1154 here in Bloomfield, sponsored by Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. This evening, I've brought with me several of our Boy Scouts and a couple of special guests who also serve and support the organization. Our Senior Patrol Leader, Diami Watson, First Class Scout, Please raise your hand, say hello. Next to him, Davion Murray, Tenderfoot. <laughs> Next, Gerald Blaze, Scout Tenderfoot. Tyler Albert, Scout Tenderfoot. Isaac Ray, Tenderfoot. And soon to be crossover, Malik Nelson, Weeblo 2. That tall gentleman at the end is a very special guest, and Diami would like to introduce him. Come on over. I mean, sorry, Davion, come on over. Who do you want to introduce? Um, I'll be introducing Mr. Lewis Rawls, a veteran in the United States Army and a former Boy Scout representing the, well, saying the Scout Law. Also, our assistant scoutmaster. special guest who has joined us tonight, Mr. Anthony Jackson, a veteran of the United States Navy and also a former Boy Scout here in the town of Bloomfield. He will be our honored guest this year in the Memorial Parade and will be riding in the Boy Scout float. So I'd like to introduce you Mr. Anthony Jackson. <laughs> As you can see, we have a few veterans of the military who serve us. And one of the programs that the Boy Scouts are involved with every year is honoring our veterans on Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and throughout the year. Recently, we put together a plot on the grounds of Bethel AME Church to honor veterans of foreign wars, and especially those veterans of World War II, who we are running out of days to honor. Uh, in the congregation at Bethel, there were several members who had served in World War II, and we are now down to our very last member who's still living. In addition to honoring our veterans, we do many service projects here in the town of Bloomfield. One in particular is our annual food drives. We also participate in activities and programs to build leadership skills. Our scouts attend Scout University at the University of Massachusetts. We camp, we sail, we canoe, we hike. We do all those things that build character and leadership skills. And tonight, with just a few of us who are here, we just want to say thank you to the town of Bloomfield for all the support that you give us. We try to be involved with as many activities in town as possible, the fire department's annual day, the Bloomfield town days, and we're continuing to try to develop the young men into leaders of the future. And tonight, they have an opportunity to say thank you to you because we know scouting is about service. 
and service to your community is not something to be taken lightly. It is better for them to learn to serve than it is to receive because then they can truly become the leaders that we want them to be. Diamin, being our senior patrol leader, um, has a lot of responsibility. He has to set the example for the younger girls, the younger ones, um, and he's done a fine and outstanding job. Diamin is a sophomore at Windsor High School. And uh, I'd like to thank our parents who also came out tonight to be with us. And we have a small gift that we'd like to present to you. Thank you all for inviting us tonight. You know these young men have school tomorrow. But we also couldn't leave here without thanking one special member of the council, Mr. Rick Rickford. Rickford served as our Cub Scout master before he was a town council member. <laughs> and we're sharing it with you because we expect him to come back at some point in time because he still has a son. And they told me a long time ago when I first became a Cub Scout leader, my son was six years old. They gave me a yardstick and they said, you have this much time to raise your son. That was 36 inches. They said, that doesn't represent 36 years. They said, because you have to chop this down to 12 inches. I said, why? He says, because the first 12 years are the most important years of his life. After age 12, it's very difficult for you to make an impression on his life. And so we took the yardstick and we cut it down to 12. He said, but he's six years old now. So one through five is already gone. And so all we had was six through 12 to make an impression on their lives. My son now is a senior at Glastonbury High School and he's on his way to college. And some of the other young men who were members of our troop are now on their way to college. But we realize how important this responsibility is. And with your support and your encouragement, we'll continue to do the best job we can for the young people in this community. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we wait for him to do something. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was wonderful, right? Something new and different. Wonderful. Okay, so all our counselors are here except Counselor Goff and Counselor DiLorenzo. And Counselor Waterhouse, I'm very sorry. Um, right now we have a presentation, um, an update from the Department of Public Works Building Committee. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, Mr. Schenck. The Public Works Building Committee has its genesis in a report from November 2014 prepared by Weston Sampson outlining many of the uh, shortfallings, uh, lack of facilities, number of problems that existed at our Public Works facility. The referendum of November 2016 
a bond issue was approved to move forward to follow the advice and develop plans to correct, amend, and install new works at the Public Works Building. Our first meeting was in January 2017. We're progressing to the point where we're virtually ready to go out to bid. And what we're going to do tonight, we have <coughs> Sir Jeff Rudy of the Western Sampson will make a presentation uh, showing our progress to date. And also with us, our construction manager, uh, Mr. Gordon Sober of PDS, which is our construction manager. And he will address a number of things, including MBA requirements and where we stand in that issue. And after that, of course, we'll be open to any questions that you might have. So at this point, I'll introduce Mr. Alberti. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jeff Alberti with Weston and Sampson. I have a brief presentation. Uh, am I OK here for you guys to see? I just want to make OK, yeah, the hard copy. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to start off this presentation with just a recap of what the project goals were for this project, because that's really what was driving uh, all of our efforts in preparing uh, this public works facility renovations and code improvements project. Really, the first goal that we identified was the need to develop renovations and additions to address the current code, safety, and operational efficiencies that existed uh, throughout the facility. And with that, uh, we obviously understand that we have a certain set amount that we need to meet, and that's the budget of 11433 So throughout the process, we've kept our eye on the ball, really understanding what those code deficiencies are, safety issues, and operational efficiencies were and really came up with a plan that we felt would uh, meet all the requirements now and into the future within your budget. But in summary, and, and this goes back uh, many years, we did do a comprehensive analysis of some of the deficiencies. And I just wanted to highlight some of the major elements that we were able to break them down into. Uh, the first being that the buildings currently do not comply with today's building codes. They were built at a much different time for a much different code. So it lacks systems like a sprinkler system, uh, ADA accessibility, has inadequate egress and fire separations throughout the building as the operations have changed. We also took a look at the mechanical codes and the plumbing codes and we found that the facility didn't meet current codes for number of fixture counts for proper male and female toilet facilities. Uh, also is inadequate volume of water for the operations. We found the mechanical system needed upgrade to improve the ventilation, air exchanges, and carbon monoxide detection systems. Uh, we also focused in on some past OSHA and DEEP standards. Uh, some that included some ocean deep citations because the operations were outdated and didn't meet today's standards. Uh, also focused in on the fueling facility and wash facilities that needed upgrade to meet those requirements. Uh, we've, we kind of rounded out our assessment on the site security. It's a very expensive operation, has a lot of high value equipment and materials, and we felt that uh, there's a need to really protect that investment that you've all made in that operation by providing proper security throughout the site. And then finally, uh, we took a look at the operations and identified all the efficiencies from inadequate storage areas to inadequate employee facilities to undersized maintenance areas. So through that process, we began by looking at what has been completed and what is underway. But before I get into that element, one of the things that we did identify was some of the deficiencies. And I wanted to just show you a couple of quick photographs. Um, this is a photograph of the existing uh, vehicle and equipment storage area. And as you can see, it's essentially jam-packed with vehicles. And if you look in the back of the slide, you can see the yellow wall. And if you keep your eye on that wall, because this building is so undersized, when the staff has to have their regularly mandated training uh, it, with a large group, they actually have to pull all that equipment out, set up chairs and tables in the vehicle storage garage to try to get that staff together for the proper training. And this is primarily due to the change in operations and the growth. So there really was inadequate space to properly meet and train the staff. And another item that we felt was important to just touch on was the fact that this is a single shift operation. However, they're there in some cases for many shifts during the storm events, and we know we've had quite a bit of those in the past few years. And it's important to keep that staff there on staff and be able to respond to the needs of the community. And sometimes they have to take a quick break, and really what they, the only thing that they can do is set up a cot and a part storage room, and you see on the left, in the upper right, in a hallway, in the center, yeah, right next to some file cabinets, and the bottom right, actually, in a shower. So there's really inadequate space within the facility, and these were some of the items that we wanted to address through this process. 
So the work that's been completed to date, uh, we have completed schematic design as well as design development. So really advance the drawings through the initial stages through uh, and getting ready for our construction documents. Some of the things that we've completed are survey, hazardous materials investigation. We've done our subsurface geotechnical investigation. We've done an overall structural analysis, analysis of the building with the goal of trying to maximize and reuse that facility to control costs and use that to develop our overall building and site concepts. We've also gone through the permitting process in Lynn Wetlands, TPZ, and ZBA and have completed that. And so currently we're in the process of moving through the construction documents, preparing our final plans and specifications. Now just to give you an overview of the facility and the project, I just wanted to touch on some highlights. This is an overall aerial view. You can see the developed area in the center, upper center part of your screen. That's where the existing 21 Southwood Ave, uh, Southwood Drive facility is located. And there are really two parts to this. The first part being uh, the development of that 21 Southwood Drive parcel outlined in red. And what that includes is office and employee facility additions, as well as a vehicle maintenance addition. And I'll get into some of the details of that in a moment. And then maximizing the reuse of the existing facility, again, to control costs. And then also providing a new fueling facility as well as doing some site reconfiguration. As we add to the building and reconfigure the site, we're displacing some of the operations. And as a result, uh, the, the next step and one of the proposed uses of the site would be to use the 30 Southwood Drive parcel. And that's shown in the bottom part of your screen to, for some of the items that have been displaced through the development of this initial phase. And that's for some paved yard areas, bulk material storage areas, uh, some cold seasonal storage, as well as uh, storage for snow and storm debris during the emergency situations throughout the town. As we look a little bit closer at the 21 Southwood Drive uh, parcel, you can see the aerial view here. And there are several existing buildings that are highlighted in yellow. And the goal here was to, again, protect those, maintain those, and reuse those. This is an overall site development plan. As you can see, the existing building shown in yellow in the two additions. The addition to the right, the long linear building, that's the office and employee facility space. And the addition to the left represents the vehicle maintenance operations. And you can also see in the bottom right the proposed fueling facility. The area that's shaded in gray represents the new parking area as well as the circulation space, all with the goal of coming up with new parking and circulation to maintain a safe and efficient movement throughout the site. There's large vehicles that are constantly circulating through that site that we want to split off from the smaller privately owned vehicles for safety purposes. We've also advanced the building, and this is an ISO showing the overall view, kind of a bird's eye view of the facility. The building on the left represents the overall roof plan, and on the right is just a cross section showing you the different uses of the space, where the large open volumes represent where vehicles are going to be stored, and you can see the other areas with walls represent uh, occupied employee spaces. The two additions that I mentioned earlier are outlined in red on the left-hand side. As we move a little bit closer and take a closer look at the layout, it's a very efficient construction type, and we really try to come up with uh, easy column lines to help uh, maximize the efficiencies and minimize the costs. And you can see in the upper part of the screen is the proposed addition for the office's employee facilities. That'll address a lot of those conditions I showed you earlier. And the bottom right is the vehicle maintenance addition, where you're maintaining a multi-million dollar fleet within the community, and then maximizing the reuse of the existing facility to conduct renovations to have proper locker shower, to locker shower toilet facilities for both male and female employees. This is an overall build building rendering showing a couple of views. The view in the upper part would be as you enter the site. And just a couple of takeaways are that we really wanted to match the existing architecture that it, the materials that are there. We didn't want it to look like, stand out like a sore thumb, essentially. We wanted to match it uh, as best as we could. We also wanted to control costs by making sure that our volumes were appropriate for the type of use. So in the front where you have offices and employee facilities, we have the lower mass. And then you can see in the back portion, uh, there's a much higher volume. That's where the vehicle maintenance operations take place. That's where they're raising dump bodies, lifting large vehicles, so you have higher volumes. And you can see in the bottom, again, that uh, relationship where on the left-hand side is the vehicle maintenance, the right-hand side is the office and employee facilities, and really controlling costs by ma managing those volumes. You'll notice we have a lot of windows. We have a lot of translucent panels. The goal there is to get as much natural daylight into the facility, 
to minimize the use of the artificial lighting. Taking all this information, uh, we worked closely with our construction manager to develop an overall project cost and really broke it down into high level of details, but I'm just showing you, showing you the overall summary. So based on our current estimate, we have our construction costs and the associated contingencies from your change order contingency to the GMP, guaranteed maximum price contingency. And as we're also carrying estimating design contingency because there's still some design work that's ongoing. That's about 9.9 .9 million. Then we build on our soft costs, including builder's risk insurance, professional fees, furnishings, communications, construction support, as well as temporary facilities and an overall project contingency, puts our total project costs currently at 11,418,000. And as mentioned earlier, that's compared to the budget of 11,433,000. So really the takeaway is that we've achieved what we indicated we would do is address all of those code safety and operational efficiencies within the budget that's been established. And one of the items that we did uh, really look at closely was implementing cost control measures. So there are several bid alternates that are included. And these are items that we felt would be good to do if they can fit within the budget, but not a necessity to address those code safety and operational efficiencies. And those are listed on the screen in front of you. So should we receive uh, competitive bids, we'll ensure that bid alternates will only be accepted if they remain within the budget that's been established for the project. And then in closing on my portion, uh, the schedule, I've prepared a high level outline schedule of what the project uh, has basically moving forward. It starts with the minority outreach, which will be done by PDS. And uh, Mr. Sober will talk about that in a moment. And that begins on May 2nd through June 29th. Concurrently, we'll be completing our design documents. We'll be ready by May 25th. Once those are complete, we'll move through the procurement process with PDS. May 29th through June 29th, having a guaranteed maximum price by early July, at which point we'll bring that to the committee for their review and approval by mid-July. And based on uh, an approval received at that time, we'll be able to move forward with construction at the end of July with about a 12-month window for construction. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Gordon to talk a little bit about uh, the minority participation update. Thank you, Jim. Madam Mayor, uh, thank you. Um, just uh, a, a quick aside. Um, PDS is a Bloomfield company. It's been here for 50 years. Uh, we're very proud to be doing this job. As a matter of fact, I'm here with uh, Jeff Nyland, who's going to be our project manager throughout the job. Um, we know that one of the um, one of the crucial items was trying to make sure that we um, have a strong showing on the MBE side and through the outreach uh, and also through local uh, participation in the, uh, in the comp, uh, project. Um, as Jeff had shown before, we had a timeline of May 2nd uh, through uh, June as far as for the outreach. It actually started out sooner. Uh, last week, we've, um, we put out about 3,500 emails uh, to all the registered uh, minority firms. We used the DAS uh, listing uh, to get them out to all the minority firms that are listed through their, uh, through their system that are registered uh, MBEs. Um, we are also a lot of a word of mouth, as, uh, as you see up here on um, last Tuesday, I was uh, at the uh, MCC, uh, the Minority uh, uh, Construction Council, and um, actually uh, spoke there at one of their meetings, just trying to um, develop a, a little bit of energy, uh, let people know that where that, you know where the project is. Um, we are uh, we are certainly um, happy that the previous project had received such um, a response to its bids. Uh, that's the human services uh, building. So we, th we think that we're in pretty good shape um, as far as being able to get the responses in. Uh, we're pretty confident that we're going to, uh, we know we'll meet the, we'll, we know we'll meet the uh, requirements, um, but we're pretty confident that we'll probably be able to exceed that also, uh, just based on the response that came from the previous project and, um, and, and the climate in the, uh, in the bidding climate right now. Um, and I think one of the things that we um, wanted to go through uh, is actually talk a little bit about right now, um, because the, um, the certification process, um, the only thing that we can really go by 
is the state certification process. As a matter of fact, in the in the contract, you, you guys stated that um, we, you know, all the MBEs must be state certified through uh, through the um, DAS. Uh, so we are making sure that right now, with this part of this outreach, uh, is that we're looking to uh, develop teams if we have to. Um, some of the firms may not be able to meet uh, a lot of the criteria or they may not be able to meet the size of the packages. So what we're trying to do is actually bring them in, get a feel for who they are, what their specialties are, and then how we can go and create packages that will be able to accommodate as many uh, of those firms as possible. Um, Yes. You might even speak into the mic just for Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. We can hear you, but I don't think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, is that we're going to try and find creative ways to uh, develop packages in order to uh, make sure that we get the largest amount of participation as possible. And I think that answers mine, and it's already up to thank you. So, so you're going to... Yes. Just, just so that I have an understanding, you're going to, based on the minority contractors that show interest, you're going to break up the packages based on that instead of breaking up, breaking up the packages prior to. Right. Well, we're going to. There, there are basic packages that you can break up. Sight lighting. Some of the the, um, the electrical packages uh, can be broken up between the low voltage and and they create smaller packages, so they're they're easier for the the firms to uh, to meet uh, the criteria. Um, but the the problem is is that uh, you know in in this you know, we're talking about I think it's what is it two point four million dollars that we need to go ahead and, and give out in um, in minority participation packages. Uh, so some t it's going to take a little creativity to be able to go and get those uh, and get those firms. So it may mean that um, we have site lighting separate from uh, you know separate from uh, landscaping. You know, we have site contract uh, concrete. So we're trying to figure out what you know when they when they come when they come in we can we have a general idea as to what those packages are but we really like to see the response so that we can maybe tailor it a little bit better or marry up if you have to if we have to right. yes mm -hmm. is, is there going to be a bonding requirement uh that's the tricky part um we have to we have to take a look at that because we, typically you would have bonding requirements um the problem is is that uh, if there's not, um, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of risk put on our shoulders, um, and so it, it, and that, um, so we have to we have to go through, and that we haven't decided on yet. Because it's possible that you could do a shore guard if you wanted to. Yeah, I know. I know it opens you up to a lot more. Yeah. Right? I get it, but I, I I hope that you understand that that could be a barrier. Mm -hmm. So I, that we, we, we do work with it. Yeah, and that's right? why I was that's why I'm hesitant about okay. it. Excellent. Any other questions? I'm sorry, Councillor May. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. This is the first time we've heard on this, about this project, and it's been out there since uh, probably about as long as the uh, human <laughs> services facility. It was the first time we've heard anything about it. A couple of questions. Uh, I was looking at the, your, your, the picture about the, which was shown to us very from, from the very beginning about the congestion in the vehicle storage building. Uh, yet. Uh, I have to ask, is there sufficient, you're not expanding that building, uh, but you're providing additional area for vehicle maintenance, will we still be having that same kind of chock-a-block parking arrangement in that building? Uh, no, as part of the process in the project, we're looking to improve, there's an existing pre-engineered metal building on site uh, with limited access, so we're looking to improve the access to that building, which will therefore open up that for better storage, more efficient storage, and thus eliminating uh, everything that's sardine and jam packed in. Oh, so there's another alternative. Okay. Yes. Uh, and the other question is, uh, you've identified the uh, shortcomings of the present facility. But what year are you designing this to, considering that things are changing or things grow or demands for more space or new technologies? Sure. What, what, are we just fixing it to today's standard or well, how do you how do you
start a project like that? So we spent, uh, w this project has been ongoing for many years. We spent a lot of time up front looking at change in, changes in technology, changes in operation, and to the best of our ability, we look to design this for the future. For 50, It's a 50-year building, uh, and so with that, we are able to meet the current demands, uh, the near-term demands, and then what we do is we get creative in how we design the interior for the future demands that we haven't quite identified that no one can really put their hands on. And that's done with different construction types so that walls can be easily moved, systems can be easily modified, and adjustments can be made. But we are looking for this to be a long-term improvement based on the current operation and uh, what the current market and industry is showing for the types of operations that we see in the future. Okay, good. One, one final question. Um, there was a desire at early on to get some sort of solar uh, energy package with, uh, along with this building, on top of the roof of this building. Uh, it was discussed. I, obviously, it didn't go very far. But I hope that uh, you can still work with, uh, work in, in that direction because they're you know, reducing the cost of the operations, electric, so forth, is not only important to the town, but also the environmental benefits of having the solar. I know that there are uh, other town projects that are looking at, them, including the human service facility, uh, no cost power purchase agreement, uh, something you might want to look into. Uh, company will put up the panels and you just pay a lease, basically. Of course, you have to make sure it's to your liking, but uh, it's, it's just, it still promises to provide a discount uh, for the electric cost over, you know, immediately. Right. So I mean, I'd like to hear more about that as we go forward because to make it a building of the future. Sure. And just to quickly comment on that, any of the new construction that we design, we typically will build in uh, the additional dead load for any solar panels so that when that becomes an economical solution, it can be easily uh, retrofitted to the, to the existing building. Uh, to the new components. The existing building is a little bit more difficult because that added load might require you to, you to do structural upgrades, but as a minimum, we're factoring in uh, some of those requirements for future solar within the new additions. So that'll be, that will be part of your, of your development package for strengthening the load factor? On the uh, newer uh, facilities, but not on the existing. Not, not on the existing. The existing is only being upgraded to meet current snow loads um, at very, um, point loads at very specific areas of the building. Overall, the cost to upgrade the entire roof, uh, all of the structural steel, uh, would uh, send us quite a bit above our budget that has been established. So, uh, one last, sorry. So that would assume that the, you wouldn't get full uh, energy benefit if you haven't got all your roof under, under some sort of solar. It'd just be a, an add-on, a little bit of a, a boost? Correct. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Councilor Merritt? Uh, one of the <coughs> main reasons for going ahead with this, at least as soon as possible, was the contamination from the oil tanks and gasoline tanks. And, 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 is that being taken care of early in the project? And uh, it occurred to me while you were talking, <laughs> talking about 50 year building, probably within 20 years we will no longer be using gasoline. So I'm wondering <laughs> how you're looking to the future there. And sure. you, you, we, we put a charging unit in for. Uh, battery operated trucks. I don't know how that's going to be. Sure. Uh, so the removal of the existing tanks uh, and construction of the new tanks would be done early in the process. So that's part of the package uh, that would deal with any, uh, if there were any residual contamination that's identified that would be addressed as part of that. And with regard to uh, the alternative fuels, the change in the future, that's a very good point. And in fact, on our plan, we have an area designated near where the fueling operations are going to be that's set aside for any future alternative fuels. So we have a footprint that's reserved, saved, nothing will get constructed there, so that in, as technology changes, we'll have the ability to incorporate it on site. And the tanks are above ground. Mm -hmm. The new Obviously, tanks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't even have to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Deputy Mayor? No. Uh, I'm go I just want to go back to the minority participation. What is the goal that you guys are shooting for as far as the percentage-wise? Uh, well, by a contract, it's 30 percent. 30 percent, right. You don't uh, look to, you, you're not looking to exceed that 30 percent. Well, that's, the, that's the point, is that we're trying to figure out uh, ways, and that May 2nd will certainly ha uh, have a big hand in 
directing us how we can. We are looking, to, well, of course we're looking to exceed it. Um, you know, we, we just, we're actually uh, just finished phase one of a project for the state um, where it was the early demo package. Uh, we're working at the CSU. We were actually to achieve 100% participation for the uh, first phase of those projects. So we're always looking for ways to exceed that. So uh, my second question is, with the timeline, we're looking at, uh, you know, put starting the construction roughly around Ju July, Correct. you're saying? Mm -hmm. So with July, you said 12 months, how would that affect the winter um, conditions? How would that impact with the construction? Well, what we're, uh, we're phasing, and Jeff probably will talk better to it, but the phasing uh, of it is that we're looking to get the additions uh, up in place so we have the, uh, ability to get everybody in under a roof and, and then start the interior construction while it's in the inclement weather. So let me just put it this way, just kind of give me the breakdown of the project, what's the first phase and the timeline. Okay, yeah. uh, well the first phase would, would be the, uh, the working of the foundations, uh, the, the tooling <coughs> island, um, and then the foundations for the additions. Then we'll, then we'll move through, at that point, uh, and then start the uh, construction of the walls and, and roofing and whatnot for the addition. Uh, fit that out, and then once the fit out is done on the uh, the two additions, then we'll then we'll go into the. I'm sorry, I, um, I usually talk loud enough, for it, but um, then we'll start in on the um, then we'll start in on the renovation to the existing building. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? <clears throat> Uh, Councilor McLeary. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, back to the minority uh, contractor, um, and I think you've mentioned something about safeguard insurance. Sure guard. Sure guard insurance. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, what is the benefit and what is the um, con of that? Well, um, the problem um, the problem mm -hmm. with uh, sure guard is in most of the um, contracts for that insurance are larger projects. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's difficult to use that on a smaller project. Um, it's one of the advantages is it, it covers the project as a whole uh, versus the individual contractors require, needing that, um, needing the bonding. So what is the, what is the um, fiscal impact for an $11 million project if we were to get sugar? Would it add to the, the cost or would it decline, would the cost stay flat? Um, Construction costs, that is. So if you were to go out and get that for minority contractors, would it have a significant impact on your budget? I tell you, to be honest, I don't know, but maybe do you have an idea? I don't, I don't know. Sure, that. talking Shergar? Sure, yes, yeah, Shergar. Sure, 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 excuse The mic. Yeah. So Shergar, in the essence, is, is where uh, subcontractors can't get bonds, or maybe they can get bonds, and the general contractor says, I will take on that risk mm -hmm. rather than do it. And it, it's not a simple question to answer because it's based on uh, a, a lot of factors that go involved. But definitely the more risk comes about is, is that if I have guys that cannot get bonds, the general contractor himself is taking on that risk. Now I may have to pay premiums, they may yeah. vary in level, but in turn, it's, it's like a deductible on a car, if you would imagine, is that SureGuard has deductibles. So you're buying it, so if there was, say, the first $100,000, the general contractor, the construction manager, is covering that first $100,000 until the policy kicks in. So it's, it's so if I can continue, mm -hmm. it's a basis of judging your subcontractors and how you think that risk is. Now, you may have a lot of smaller subcontractors that are okay fiscally, but they haven't gone through the bonding process. They don't go through that paperwork. They've never applied for a bond before. So the insurance company is going to use them as a higher risk. Mm -hmm. They're going to pay a higher rate, et cetera. Not meaning they're not a good financial company. So in trying to achieve higher goals, which is what we all want to do, is you have to understand, one, where is our work? Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we have a lot of electrical work? Do we have a lot of HVAC work? And then, and then come to an analysis of the minorities and what kind of work that they perform. If we don't have a minority 
that can do a million dollar electrical package just for the argument, well then you have to try to break it apart because we have minorities that could do 50,000 or 100,000. So maybe you break it apart and they could get uh, the fire alarm work, we break it apart. Or the, we break the site lighting into the thing. So it becomes a more manageable package. And that's how you try to incorporate more people into the mix. So it, it, it's a lot of pieces to the parts. It's not a simple answer. Uh, but, you know, in overall, when you're trying to do sure guard or sub guard, whatever you call it is, the GC is taking on that higher amount of risk. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to go, are you guys familiar with the Hartford? Yes, Hartford program. Hartford, Hartford program. Yes. So they developed in one of those scenarios what they called a minority contingency, where they said, we understand the potential problems of a minority contractor, smaller, may not bid it correctly, da 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 da, don't want them to get hurt. So there was a pot of money set aside where the construction manager could go and say, my minority is having a problem, they bid it incorrectly, whatever it may be, and here's a separate pool of money to come and say, okay, we can take it out of that to help assist the minority contractor. Now, that isn't specifically set up this way, not saying that it can't be set up this way, but is that how do you do that? How do we adjust the money for that? Right. I that it's, excuse me. I think I just wanted to have on record that there's other alternatives. Yes. Realizing that some minority contractors might want to play, but they can't for certain reasons. But I'm glad to hear that it's something that you would look into. I'm glad to also hear that you'll break down the packages if you need to, or marry up if you need to. So I think one of the uh, concerns that I had for the minority is to make sure that we give them as much of an opportunity as possible. To participate and, and that would be the goal but one thing that we don't want to let happen is is that you don't want to have a minority contractor get into a position that where they're going to fail correct. Mm -hmm. that that's correct. not good for them it's not good for us it's not good for the town correct okay and then when in looking at these packages and say who's shown interest what are their capabilities and do we have the ability to break the work apart in order to try to make that feasible for them correct so we may have a guy that um, he, he does a particular task, right? But there's only one minority that can do that. Then we have a problem of breaking that package out because state bidding law says you have to have three people bid it. It, right. it doesn't work. Right. Right? right. So we're, we're trying to, it's a gauge of a lot of things. You got to understand, you know, who is interested in the job, what, what services they perform, what are their financial capabilities, and how do we take all of that together and say how can we do it in a fashion where we can achieve good quality work, the con subcontractor can be successful, and we can keep on budget. So it's, it's a, a lot. lot of things happening. I know. I know. It's and a lot. <laughs> one of the things that Hartford had done was they basically made the decision to, for lack of a better term, self-insure. Yeah. Yeah, for those. So, yeah. so they they created they created those um, that pool of money yeah. uh, as a as a shore guard or a yeah. safeguard or a sub guard. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, sorry. No. Um, my next question um, is still on the lines of the minority contractor. What I've been hearing is a lot of, um, you know, general contractors understand that they have to hit this percent goal. And they've been doing a lot of pass-throughs through because there's a loophole in the state um, regulation um, with procurement. So you'll go to like a, a, a lumber yard that's owned, maybe owned by a minority, and you'll purchase a million dollars um, in, in, in lumber or in steel or in wires, and you'll hit that, that $2.4 million goal. Um, that you have out there for minority contract because it's 30% of the actual cash value and not actually 30% of the um, uh, people working. Um, another thing is that true minorities, um, I hear a lot of pass-throughs. Um, there are some companies that may have, um, you know, they, they get their wives to, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, own the company and because the state law includes women in the WBE, MBE disadvantage, um, businesses, uh, it counts towards the 30%. So could you, I know it's kind of, you know, uh, premature to ask you for a definite answer. Will you try your best to um, get actual true minority firms and particularly Bloomfield firms um, and work with them to make sure that they're working on this project? Um, because uh, I look at these guys as 
uh, guys who are just trying to pay their bills. They're not trying to buy mm -hmm. a, a yacht. They're not trying to um, go on six vacations or fly over country or across the country. What they're just simply trying to do is just take care of their family and take care of their workers' family. Uh, and I would like to see the money that we're spending, this taxpayer dollars, you know, funnel through back into our community because they're going to be the ones to go to the local Home Depot. They're going to be the ones to go to the Stop and Shop. They're going to be the ones to pay um, their property taxes. So I would like to see um, true minority Bloomfield residents who own construction companies in the town of Bloomfield or may have their company registered somewhere else but live in Bloomfield have opportunity on this, this, this project. And I just, you know, I was... I saw the email that you guys sent out mm -hmm. for um, minority, you know, for minority participation. I want, I wish we would do a little bit more boots on the ground, um, and not just send emails out and have these traditional, um, you know, these oh, workshops. No. And when you do have these workshops, kind of coach them through like how to get the bonding, the, mm -hmm. you know, how to do the um, the certified payroll, get their paperwork in, because most of the the, we, the problem with minority contractors are the back end of their businesses. And so when they do get to these projects, um, they can never ev elevate because you keep breaking out small packages for them. So they can't take on the one million or two million or three million because they don't have the capacity to do um, you know, the bonding mm -hmm. because we always set them up to do these small packages. And so they can't bid on a five million dollar project or a ten million dollar sure. project. So right. I just hope I just hope that we you know, we help them, you know, continue to build their, their, their business. Um, well, that's part of the reason why, as we said before, that we're going to try and get the firms to Demaria. sort of partner Demaria. up mm -hmm. and now give them an opportunity to go ahead and work <coughs> on the bigger packages. We also have um, Kurt Harrison uh, from Not Make Planners with us, and he, and he helps the minority firms with the with the paperwork, mm -hmm. keeping everything, making sure that all, all the paperwork is right in so they don't miss a requisition. They don't miss their uh, paperwork filings that would hold up a check to them. But it, so so we do we do do that. I think the other the other piece that that, that we have to that we have to be careful of though is that unlike Hartford where they have a local um, requirement well, a, a, a local uh, benefit mm -hmm. uh, for the, the firms that are local Hart Hartford firms, uh, Bloomfield does not have that. And so we're bound by uh, procurement laws that we go out and, and we, can't, we can't send it to just strictly minority firms. They, we have to allow the WBEs mm -hmm. and the disabled firms to go ahead and participate as, as equally as the minority firms. So I think what, what we are trying to do, and again, by getting it out to the, that's why I spoke at the MCC, that's why you know, mm -hmm. Kurt has is, is, is gone out to all the different minority organizations to make sure that, the, that it's on their newsletter, it's, in the, it's, it, it's talked about. So we are trying to get as, as, as far a reach as possible. So, Councilor McCleary, can you hold I, a minute, please? Let, let Councilor Mary. Oh, I wasn't question. finished with my chain of questions. I, You've asked a couple. Can we just let Councilor Merrick go and then you can resume? And this is right, and, and I, I won't take a lot of time. I just think it's, it's, you're asking a lot for the contractors to do this. It's going to be some cost. I'm wondering if the town can help out somehow. Um, I, I think it may be that we need to find some way of support, whether it's in rules or with money or whatever. But if, if this is going to happen. It shouldn't. I, it sounds to me like too much to ask of you. You, mm -hmm. you seem to be wanting to do this, but it's, it's, if we can help you somehow, maybe do what Hartford's doing or something along that line, we might might get further than just we don't want to just be on you for this. Well, I, I, so we have an obligation, is that of part of what the state mandates is, and, and of having my minority participation, and the goal is thirty percent scenario in our contract. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the ability to determine who's a minority contractor and who's not a minority contractor. Mm -hmm. That's done by the state of Connecticut. They have to file. There's, there's a process. I, I can't control any of that. Mm -hmm. So I understand where uh, Councilman here Kiss says, well, you know, women firms, is that really the case? That may be true. That may be not true. But I can't, I can't do anything about it. Yeah, it's a state, well, 
Yeah. And, and, and we the, right at the MCC, at the, just at the last week, uh, uh, Cheryl Sharp was there from CHRO. Mm -hmm. uh, and I asked her this very question explicitly. I said, is there a way that we can go and put that, put that out? Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is there a way that we can direct it uh, and separate out the um, minority from the women owned and the disability. And she said, under current law, there, you cannot. Uh, now, it, that requires a town to ordinance of some, yeah. of some sort to go ahead and to initiate that. Yeah. And I don't know if, to be honest, I don't know if, if there's enough time to be able to develop that that can get through legal and, and all in time for bidding at this point. So, so if you want to put a pool of money together, no. <laughs> so, so I think the other part is, and, and the councilman brings up about, you know, people that are in Bloomfield, okay? So when we get lists from the state, it lists where the residing company is. So the person who owns the company, he may live in Bloomfield, but the address of his company is Hartford or Windsor or whatever it's going to be. So we're not provided information no. about where the person that owns that company lives. Right. So if the council and is the, as is the case with with many of the Bloomfield com uh, Bloomfield companies, they are they are uh, I mean the residents their companies are registered in Hartford for that uh, advantage of being able to participate on on the Hartford program. So so I would say if there was an ability for the town to help, then I think the ability for town to help would be is to reach out in some form or fashion to say, hey if if you own a company and your physical address is actually in Hartford or Windsor or whatever it may be, but you live here, then these companies could, how does the town help to reach out and say, let us know that, right? So then we know who that company is. I mean, we can't create a package that says only these people can bid on it, but at least we know who those players are. I have the list of the, of the, the um, companies that are registered in, in Bloomfield. And I believe there's about 20 of them. And some, some work in the management, some do work in the construction. So there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of both and be able to, right. to blend them so, in. So, so bear in mind, it works the other way too. The company that's here in Bloomfield, the people that own it may live someplace else. Right. So right. there's, you know, there's right. six of one half dozen of the other. Right. Mm -hmm. Council McClare. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, a way, just I don't know if your company has an intern or if this project has an intern. Um, a way to find that out is if you go to the Secretary of State's business wing of the Secretary of State's office, you can search the company and their, with their business filing um, and their formation, their business formation, you can find out where the uh, person's, the owner's physical address is. So I know it may be a lot of time and energy uh, dedicated to that, but if you have an intern, that'll be a perfect opportunity for your intern to go to the Secretary of State's. Well, I'm outside. sure most of the people will be coming to the okay. to the outreach. I would okay. assume that they're going to be here. They'll show up on May 2nd. Okay. Um, I, I I would assume that would be the case. Okay. And and uh, you know I've spoken to Garfield Gunter. Or I've spoken to a couple other firms directly, and and they will certainly be they will certainly be here. Okay. What we can also do is put it on the town website. So we can get that out, that um, information out as well. Mm -hmm. We do also have a list of contractors that we can try to reach out to as well to try to help. But um, speaking to Garfield is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, he, he does reside here in Bloomfield and he's an amazing um, contractor. Are there any other questions? Okay. Councilor Marshall Neely. Thank you so much. Uh, your presentation was really nice. It's very informative. I, I was going to ask questions uh, with regard to the 30% minority, but they were already addressed. With regard to the phase one, phase two, do you have uh, a timeline for uh, when you're going to start phase two? And also, do you have uh, a compliance manager that will be out there making sure that uh, costs don't go up? We want to stay on on target with what we're what we're doing do uh, you have that the cost manager is Jeff so um, OPM. yes oh Sorry. an OPM okay owners project manager yeah um, okay 
Um, Did I lose you? Yeah. <laughs> um, but the um, uh, I, I think from the 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 mechanisms, the way that the construction management um, um, delivery method is set up, um, is that we're working. I mean, that's really what we've done, as as Jeff has explained before. That's how we ended up with those um, uh, all add alternates in the pricing because we've been working to try and keep those numbers down. So we will certainly be there working the whole time uh, to ensure that those costs don't go over. Um, and, and we do have a compliance uh, person, as I mentioned, uh, nutmeg planners, to ensure that the minority uh, participation is, uh, is adhered to. Okay. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Councilor Mayor. Well, well, the director of public works is here. I wanted to ask him if he's satisfied and happy with the proposal that he's received. You're going to have to live in it. Um, good question. Um, I, I am satisfied. In to sort of get back to a question that you had asked earlier, uh, have we designed for the future? Um, Yes, I, I think we've designed for the present. I think we've had an, we have an eye. This design has an eye toward the future, with a bigger eye on the bottom line. Um, so we're cognizant of what our responsibilities are, what the budgetary restrictions are, uh, with all the other terms are. And I think I think Jeff and Gordon have done a good job, and, and the building committee's done a, a, a good job, sort of steering it into the into the right direction. So we're going to hit all of the key um, objectives. Um, and stay within budget um, with planning toward the future. You know, one of the things Jeff didn't show on some of his slides, and some of you may have seen it earlier, is you're, we're talking about a facility that was designed nearly 60 years ago. Um, so that cramped space you saw on that slide uh, was a result of the fact that the building was designed for equipment that is now two and three times the size of what it was 60 years ago. So we're dealing with some of that. Ideally, uh, we would probably eliminate all that space uh, and build it new to the appropriate size, but uh, that's, co that's not cost effective. So we've decided to prioritize what we need to have done make use of the space we have, renovate it as best we can, um, and be prepared going forward. So I, I think we've got a, as good a plan as we can have, and, and we've certainly got a, a really good layout to uh, help get us there. Deputy Mayor. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, John. I just want to go back to the timeline of when we're going to start the project. You don't foresee or you have a plan in place just to make sure that it doesn't impede on Service. Yeah, so that was a good question. I was actually yeah, I, was I wanted to hear what Jeff and Gordon's yeah. answer was because uh, <laughs> they don't, they're not responsible yeah, for the operational aspects of the yeah. department, yeah. and I was kind of curious how Jeff's yeah. approach to snow removal is going to be. Um, but uh, we're going to we're going to work as best we can with what we have. I think you know Gordon indicated that um, they're going to lay the footing for the additions. <clears throat> they're going to build some of the new space, uh, move out into it, and then do the interior work in the winter months. Um, but between the impact on winter operations and the impact on the, the work, we're going to try to do some of the work, as much of the work as we can, uh, with our own forces uh, to make sure that we can help try to control the cost. So things that we can do, we will do, you know, almost like a, a do-it-yourself type uh, effort. Um, but we need to make sure that we plan that, um, that we coordinate that in conjunction with all the other things we need to do, and then we prepare for our for our winter operations. Um, we'll, uh, we'll make it work. Uh, you know, it's really going to be really one long winter uh, that we're going to have to um, get through. Um, and uh, I think the plan that I've seen so far that Gordon and Jeff have put together uh, are, is going to have enough of the work done that it's going to give us um, a, a decent footing going into uh, December, January of okay. uh, the upcoming year. Perfect. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much for your time this evening. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank you for your support much. as well. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into citizen statements and petitions. Oh, I'm sorry. We're all set. Okay. We're all set. <laughs> Nancy, is there anything to add? No. You've done a great job. One thing I would add. I understood your question on the compliance having to do with someone monitoring the project. Um, as they are in 330 Park, they will be having an independent owner's project 
um, representative as well, which I anticipate will follow the same guidelines yes, that we've established for the other project. Yes, they just yes. haven't gotten that far yet. Okay, excellent. Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, committee chair, correct? I would like to point out that this will be a construction project, and I have uh, sometime this year, I don't want to give away the date, but sometime this year I'll celebrate my 60th anniversary in construction. Ooh. I have yet to work on a project that didn't have extras or change orders. Oh, yeah. There will be change orders, I'm sure. Uh, it's responsibility of the building committee to approve those change orders. And uh, as we did, well, the bulk of uh, our committee worked on the Carmen Avery School, and we handled our change orders there. We came in under budget. And I think we can still do the same thing here. <clears throat> and again, a lot of this is dependent upon the construction economy is when we go to bid. Hopefully we'll come in nice and low and we can handle everything. I want to thank you all for listening to us. And uh, we'll be glad to come back at any point. I shouldn't say that so <laughs> widely, but we'll be glad to come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, now, citizen statements and petitions? None? Oh, sorry. And now. Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Anything. Name and address. Good evening. I have some concern about um, educational incentive programs. Name and address. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Claudine Reed, 8 Scott Drive in Bloomfield. Now I can go? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have concerns with the, with educational incentive programs in Bloomfield. For instance, I have a friend's son who goes to First Achievement in Hartford. And if the child maintains um, a certain GPA and good behavior throughout the year, they get to go on trips, and these are also educational trips. It's partly funded by the family. Um, it's partly funded by the family, but it's very low. The so school pays for most of it, or I don't know how, who pays for most of it, but they get to go to a trip to Washington. They get to go to Pennsylvania. If they spend a week at Yukon, they've spent a week in New Jersey. They didn't spend a week at Six Flags in New Jersey. These were educational trips, but they got to go. Um, so, and Hartford also has a step-in program for kids who are high achievers. I don't see any of these programs in, in Bloomfield schools. I've been asking for the past two years to have the step-in stone program come to Bloomfield. And every time I call the Board of Ed and ask the Board of Ed about this program, they stated that, oh, the budget is already in and we don't have the money. My son do very well in school. I don't want to be a parent that brag, but he does do very well in school, academically. The only incentive that they have in Bloomfield are sports, because my son likes sports does not make him an athlete. Right now, he's playing baseball because there's nothing else in the school. I mean, all they have is he got good grades in math and they put him in Khan Academy. You know what Khan Academy is? is Hello. Yeah. He goes and he takes the thing on because he gets high grades in math. Mm -hmm. There's no incentive. There's no academic incentive for someone like my child or other kids in the school. There is in Hartford. 
how is it that you're building a, approving an $11 million project, but you can't donate some money to the public school system so the kids feel um, that there is some reward for them being good? And let me tell you something again. I was a substitute teacher for two years, and I've substitute most of the school in central Connecticut. That's um, East Hartford, New Britain, any schools in the surrounding Hartford area. And I'm telling you, Bloomfield Public Schools is one of the best behaved kids in the school system. New Britain, they're sweet kids, but they're so far behind. Manchester, they dump so much money in their school system. East Hartford, Jesus Christ, it's horrible. But when you go into a Bloomfield school system and you sit in the classroom, the kids sit there and they look at you waiting for instructions. You don't get that from other schools. You don't. You really don't get that. You get kids all over the place in New Britain school system, in East Hartford school system. I was in East Hartford school, and I, I won't even say the name of the school, but it was a fourth grade class. And at the end of the day, the principal came to me and says, Miss Reed, thank you. I said, thank you for what? I didn't do anything. He said, thank you for keeping the kids in the classroom. That's all he wanted. Not the kids to sit down and learn, not the kids to do their work, but just to not have them running around the classroom. That's, I don't know what to say about something like that. I really don't. <coughs> but when you go to Bloomfield School, the kids sit down as a sub and they look at you waiting for instructions. And there's no incentive for them. Where do they go if they get high achievement? Where do they go if they have high academics? Where do they go if they have good behaviors? First achievement, they get to go all over the place. For spring break, first achievement is open to the kids that attend <coughs> the school. First, they have like three hours of academic learning. Then in the afternoon, they have fun activities. What did the kids have in school for a bloom? <coughs> um, my son does not transition from when he leaves school over the summer very well. I figured that out, that I have to get him into some program. When he first started Bloomfield um, schools, they used to have summer, summer, summer school. In the morning you have summer school, in the afternoon you have summer camp, all one day. And that was something that was free to everyone. Now they're saying only if the child qualifies for it. Well, my son needs that bridge, otherwise he does very poorly, and it takes him a time to transition from summer to school. I've gone to the principal and asked the principal to beg her to put him in a summer school, and she's like, no. So I have to pay out of pocket so my son will have that transition, because he doesn't transition very well. It takes him a while. Now, over the summer, I paid for him to go to summer camp, and he transitioned very well. And he does very well in school. But there's nothing for him. All they put him in was Khan Academy, online math program. And he's a high achiever in math. The math teacher, the, the, the math, director of the math program at Bloomfield School told me that my son is one of the best math students in the school. But there's nothing for him. They give you these pins, these stars. And if you're not at, um, the award ceremony to figure out where these stars come from. You don't know what they're getting the stars from. There's not even a piece of paper to say, hey, um, your child scored in the 90 to 100 percentile program. I mean, for math and reading. You don't know what they just, one time he came home with three of them hanging off his sweatpants string. And you don't know what they're for if you didn't go. So we need some kind of academic incentive program. You can't be funding a million dollar project to park old cars and how, and they can come here and get tutor, uh, whatever they need to do. This place is open to the public. They can set up meetings here. But you can't fund our kids. I don't think that's fair. And we need a stepping stone program here. We need something. Last year, they had journey. This year, there's nothing. Madam Mayor? Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to ask you a question. Do you have a description of this program that you're talking about, the stepping stone program that... Uh, you understand that the council really doesn't have any ability to interact or change things at the Board of Education, but if we had some information uh, more of what you're talking about, we could pass that on and we can take it up in our next budget okay, so period the, so that maybe we can encourage some of this. The Step and Stone program is a program that if a child... Well, if you could 
get something to us in, in writing, oh, in maybe writing. another time, or whatever, if you have, or a reference, whatever. Uh, a website? Is a web website something. On, on Hartford Public Schools? Do, we have a, do your friend have like a, um, a brochure that they may have sent home about it? If you can do that, maybe to Councilman Nance's point, we can pass it over to the Board of Ed. Well, that's one program, but what about other um, fundings for programs for kids who are high achievers, like going on trips to Washington or if they oh, maintain a certain GPA and maintain their behavior, they can go towards something that's... She has her hand raised. What, what grade did you say your son was in? Currently in the sixth grade. He's in the sixth grade. Okay. Um, I believe in positive reinforcement. I believe in encouraging kids and giving them something to ascertain, to, to aspire to. I believe in that. And if you can't find anything about the Stepping Stone program, I will. But there's other programs as well. I did ask the Board of Ed whether or not they knew of programs that they could incorporate into the curriculum for our students. And I didn't get an answer that I wanted. That doesn't stop me. So you're, you're sitting here, the, the, the town council is actually um, not responsible for the Board of Ed. But that doesn't mean we don't have a concern about what goes on in our town. And so uh, as, as a citizen, I would say to you, I would look up that program and other programs because I have some other avenues where I can do that and I'm not doing it to to take the responsibility the onus on myself I'm just doing it so that I could provide something for the council so that we can maybe say hey this is available this is available this is available um, one of the things that that I would recommend is that the counselors you know, utilize the counselors as much as you can. The ask the school. Ask them. You, you ask them to, to come up with other programs for students. And, I, you know, and I believe that I know for a fact that just because you like sports doesn't make you an athlete. I know that. And I can only speak for myself when I say, <clears throat> Jennifer, that. I'll look into some programs just to help you out, not to, not to you know, step on the toes of anyone in, at the Board of Ed, but I understand your passion. Well, I went to the counselors at school, and the only thing they have to tell me is that if a child is failing, like they're getting 10s and 20s in a classroom, then there is programs to help them, but kids like my son, there's nothing for them. And I did go to Board of Ed and Board of Ed said you need to attend your counseling meeting because I'm a layman in this environment. This is where I ended up. Now, if you're directing me to somewhere else, I have no problem going. Yeah, could I just add, um, what I would suggest is to reach out to Dr. Thompson. I know right now he's facilitating some meetings with parents and discussing certain things within the school program so I would suggest that you reach out to him but yes you could always come out to the council meeting but we have to start there because they're the ones that will be able to implement some of these things that you're talking about but I think it's a prime time right now to kind of connect with Dr. Thompson because they're working with parents right now to add a lot of the programs that you're talking about. I don't know who Dr. Thompson uh, He's the superintendent for the school. Um, you have my number. I'll yes. connect with you we can connect and I can get you his information and, and, and provide it to you. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, just, just to uh, piggyback on that, the Hartford Youth Scholars Program. That's it. Yeah. But it's not in Bloomfield. It's only so for Hartford residents. Here it is. We can, we'll be able to funnel that through. Because that, that's, what, that's what you're looking for, right? So there's a model right there for them to look at. Yes. yes. It's a model, yes. 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 It's, but that's not the only program. I that's know. the only name that can come off the top I of know. my head is others. Yeah. Hartford has a lot of incentive for kids who do well. Right. Um, it's because it's a, a town where there's a lot of low income, mm -hmm. but not everyone who lives in Bloomfield are rich. Exactly. I am not rich. And I can afford to 
whisk my son off to Europe right. as some students who go to Renbrook or Loomis Chafee, um, I can't afford any of that stuff. So I have to depend on whatever program the community the has to offer. And I need something from the schools. I pay taxes here. I live right. here. Right. My son is not a problem. He does very well in school. I mean, he's not a perfect kid, but he's not hurting in the school system. Right. Did, um, did I, I think it's something that we will definitely try to help as far as giving a voice to. The ultimate decision will be theirs. But there's a lot of other schools um, that have programs that we can model, right? There's um, for, for kids who want to go study abroad, for kids who want to go um, do summer vacation and do um, community service someplace else. There's a lot of things that can be done um, that probably just have to open their eyes. To. There's even this award, I forgot the name of it. It's a child from my school, from, from my church. He goes to school in Hartford at Noah Webster. He's actually getting an academic award being presented from Central Connecticut State University. Mm -hmm. What is the kids here getting? So we are working on some programs that's going to connect with the schools. Um, we've been looking into some of those programs and bringing some people at the table with the school board. So some things are happening behind the scenes. It may not be happening as quick as you want it to happen. I haven't seen them. I, that's what, well, we just started. <laughs> so <laughs> use all the resources that you have available to you to make sure that your child gets what they, get what they need, and we will try to add a voice to that as well. I, I just wanted to to make sure you've already spoken with the Board of Ed. I've, I've brought up the issue to Board of Ed several times. I even brought up the issue with the Board of Ed because they just get a star, and the star doesn't indicate anything. The only way you know what the star means is if you attend the ceremony. Um, once every three months, they have an academic ceremony. If you don't attend the ceremony, you don't know why the child is getting a star. It's just a star. You don't know what the star is for, because I said one day, I didn't attend this, the academic ceremony, and he came in with three of them on the stick on his, his loop pants. There's no certificate. There's nothing to say. You know, all they get is a ceremony. That's it. Mm -hmm. And okay. you, your name get called. There's nothing else. And, and what was your feedback? What did they, what was the response when you asked for programs? We don't have the money. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's all I want. That's it. I have here for you um, the, the chair of the school board, Don Harris, and also there's a parent who's active. Her name is Angelique Crosdale. So if you could reach out to both, I think we can start facilitating that uh, conversation. I will, because yeah. my son was accepted to Trinity Hartford Magnet School, and I didn't send him because I really want to believe in Bloomfield School. but. The whole year, I have not seen anything to have my son, you know, any reward for his hard work in school. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything. There's no programs. They don't have Journey. Last year, they had Journey. They don't have it here because of budget cuts. There's nothing more than sports. And I hate to say that my son loves sports, but he's not an athlete. And that's all they have. And I put him in there because there's nothing else. So... I'm really disappointed in the school system because there's no incentive. The kids that, that um, at first achievement, you don't have to be a straight A student to take part. You just have to make, maintain C and above um, and good behavior. And you get to take part in other, other activities. Thank you. So, thank you for, thank thank you for your time. Much. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, Town Manager, Assistant to the Town Manager, and our Town Clerk, also a fellow Bloomfield citizens. Good evening to you. I just want to present a simple petition from some people that live in the town of Bloomfield. It was presented to me from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Hines at 25 Florence Road, 
Oh, incidentally, I live at 6 Essex Lane in Bloomfield. Um, it was a petition to simply do this to demand that the town of Bloomfield allocate the funds to fix our drainage problem of put up retainer walls as the property continues to collect water and corrosion on our decks, driveways, and sidewalks. There are four properties that reside on Florence Road in Bloomfield, Connecticut that collect water from a hill behind our homes that trickle down to our property. The hill behind our homes is also our property. The constant leakage of water has caused water damage to our decks and constant cracks in our driveways and sidewalks. For the past 10 years, we have noticed water constantly draining into the foundation of our homes and causing it to sink. If left untreated, our home's property value will decrease. We have all spent thousands of dollars to repair cracks and repairs due to the water damage on our properties that have created unsafe conditions. We are asking for help to resolve this problem. We have continued to reach out to the town officials for help in the past and were denied. This problem no longer needs to be ignored. And along with the Heinz names are 25, I mean, I'm sorry, nine other personnel. I just wanted to present that to you all as the council members. And uh, my duty is complete. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you give that to India? They can get to the record. Yeah, so that she it can get into the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? India? That's it. Okay. So um, at this time, we're going to have report from council subcommittees. And... Um, Admin Education. Um, Madam Mayor, I have nothing to report from Admin Education. Our next meeting is May 2nd. Uh, Councilor Goff is not here. Public Safety, Councilor McCleary. Madam Mayor, I have no report from the Public Safety Committee. Our next meeting is next month, the second Monday, 6.30, Conference Room 5. Committees on Committee. Madam Mayor, the uh, Committee on Committees uh, met on April 16th and has forwarded a number of recommendations to this body for consideration in tonight's meeting for uh, appointments to boards and commissions coming up later. Thank you. Land use, land use and Economic Development. Uh, land, uh, Madam Mayor, the Land Use and Economic Development Committee did not meet. We may be having a special meeting in the next couple of weeks as uh, some things are beginning to happen, and we'd be glad to report back then. Thank you. Golf, Councilor Merritt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we met tonight, and uh, it was a good meeting. We had a lot of discussions on a lot of issues. We had uh, a lot of new members, and they were interested and had a lot of questions. So it was a very useful, I think, informative meeting for everybody. Um, but the, the main thing that came up was our interest in, in getting going on the uh, management contract and a uh, search for uh, the management group. We've never had one since, not that we're unhappy with our present one, it's basically we just think it's a regular, something we should do as a matter of form, go out and uh, uh, do a uh, contract search. Um, other than that, the golf course is off to a, a rather cold start because this is one of the coldest and wettest Aprils in recent history. and. Uh, so it's, <laughs> we're hoping for better weather, and it's, that's what it's all about, good weather. So it could be a good year. Thank you. Thank you. I think the last time that went out was, what, 15 years ago? Something like Something that. Something like that. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to new business. 1718-53, consider and take action regarding sustainable Connecticut. Madam Mayor, if I may, uh, this is a recommendation from the Conservation, Energy, and Environment Committee that the town uh, participate uh, in uh, the Sustainable Connecticut program. Uh, I'm recommending that it be referred to the Land Use and Economic Development Subcommittee for review, discussion, and uh, recommendation back to the Council. So moved. Second. Any discussions? All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Ayes have it. 1718-54, consider and take action regarding adoption of shared solar resolution. Yes, this is, if I may, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members, uh, this is another recommendation from the Conservation Energy and Environment Committee. And uh, I would again recommend that this uh, item be referred to the Land Use and Economic Development uh, uh, Subcommittee for a review, discussion, and recommendation back to the Council. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. 1718-55, consider and take action regarding the approval for the application of the application for the Quality School Readiness Grant Program, Priority School Readiness Municipalities. Is there a presentation on that? Uh, basically, this is uh, the town, and, and by way of background, Mayor and Council Members, the town has historically supported uh, uh, these uh, programs. Uh, I think uh, Gail Nolan is here from the Alliance for Bloomfield's Children, ABC. If there are any specific questions, Gail, perhaps you can uh, come to the podium and, and answer uh, them. Are there any questions? Can I have a motion? So move. move. We approve it. Yep. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussions? Uh, Council McCleary. Is there any cost to the town of Bloomfield with this? Is there any um, is there any matching funds that are required by the town for this grant? Thank you. All right. All right. Readiness is a grant from the State um, Office of Early Childhood for preschool uh, spaces. So it um, allows the communities to um, set up a, a, well, the state sets up the sliding scale fee so that the parents of three and four year olds are able to go to preschool and they are helped depending on their income. Any other questions? Any other discussions? Yeah, I'd like to say. I think this is one of the most important things we do, and I feel very strongly about this. We've, as you may have heard, we had some go-arounds with uh, Bloomfield Early Learning Center a few years ago, and uh, we're now having problems with the preschools being taxed, and it threatens to put some of them out of existence. And uh, I think it's a very sad thing. Preschool is very, very important, and it's, if you want to ever close the gap, it's one of the keys to doing it. If we don't provide preschools um, as a community, we're wasting our money to some degree. This is a half truth, of course, and, and, later, and, and spending is twenty thousand dollars per kid per year in later schooling. I mean, if they're not ready to start school, some of them never catch up, and it's that important. And I think we've ignored as a town. Back in the, uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, we, we tried to have universal preschool in Bloomfield. Uh, we had the BEAT program for a few years, and we just couldn't afford to keep it going, and that, that was rather unfortunate. And we've gone ahead now with the one school on, uh, we have a, a magnet school for preschool, but it can only accommodate a few hundred out of 600 or 800 of our kids and it's just a travesty that we haven't been able to do more and in the meantime the gap is picked up by uh, by Bloomfield Area Learning Center uh, the Congregational Church and First Cathedral now is contributing and our other churches are providing space and thank goodness they are because without them uh, these kids wouldn't be getting anything. So it's, it's, it's vitally important to education. If, if you don't get the kids ready for first grade, it's, it's, it's just, it, it, by the time they're six, I think, there used to be an ad that, that by the time they're six, you know whether they're going to college or going to, going to prison sometimes. So, and that's an exaggeration. And it's certainly, it was said tonight that maybe the first 12 years are important. Well, the first six are that important. So if we really want to do something about education, we have got to address this preschool issue and give the support. Thank you. 
Councilor Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Ms. Dolan, thank you for, for your work, first of all. But I'm going to ask you a question. How many positions do you think will result from this grant? This is a continuation grant from last year, so we're just continuing over the same number of slots that we had last year, that was 76. Um, each of the programs do have wait lists, so um, we did add on to the application an additional probably 10 to 12 slots if they become available in the state. Um, we're not sure right now, you know, with the state budget, um, looking forward to that. Um, if they're going to be able to add any additional spaces or increase the rate that they are able to do that. But we're always looking for them for, okay, for so more of that. Well, I understand that it's just a maintenance effort at this point and that there might be a chance for some additional positions? Yes. Usually um, the state will look at communities for those that have filled all their spaces and those that still have openings and try to transfer them from communities that have those open spaces where children are not attending to communities where they have wait lists. All their slots are full. So all our slots are full in Bloomfield, and we have some wait lists at some of the programs that could use some more additional funding. Start. Any further discussions? Discussions? All in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. 1718-56, consider and take action regarding appointment to the Town Planning and Zoning Commission alternate position. Madam Mayor, the um, Committee on Committees met on April uh, 16th and uh, voted to uh, recommend to this body the appointment of Lisa Valera Simone, uh, Boyce and Drive, to be an alternate on the TPZ uh, Town Planning and Zoning uh, Committee, uh, replacing uh, a former alternate, and uh, we move for adoption of this position. Second. Any discussions? All in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Ayes have it. 1718-57, consider and take action regarding appointment to the Inland Wetlands and Water Course Commission. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. The, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, people who have been uh, de determined to want to re repeat their their uh, maintenance of, uh, on the uh, Inland Wetlands Committee. And uh, the Committee on Committees voted to recommend approval of Howard Hunter, Alan Butkowski, Joy Chance, and Nicholas Pankey. In addition of a new person on the board would be a recommendation for Kevin Hussein. Second. That, that's the motion. A second. Any discussions? There, will be, there are two other positions that need to be filled and they will be filled within, hopefully within the next month. Excellent. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 1718-58, consider and take action regarding appointment to the Recreation Committee. Yes, Madam Mayor, this is a, a, a bit awkward, but uh, the Committee on Committees recommended uh, Ms. Beverly Merritt to this position, and she has uh, had to decline because of uh, meeting schedules, problems with her, another committee that she apparently is sitting on. So this, uh, this recommendation will have to be withdrawn. Okay. 1718-59, consider and take action regarding appointments to the Bloomfield Youth Services Juvenile Review Board. Madam Mayor, this is a, a rather large uh, board that, uh, that is made up of some people who don't, don't reside in the town but have professional uh, abilities that uh, are important to impact upon the conditions and the needs of some of our youth. Uh, the committee met and uh, voted to recommend to you the names of Roger Bunker, Patterson Crocker, Nicole Venata Heath, Tony Harrison, Mark Mitchell, Dawn Cooper Roger, India Rogers, Officer Keenan Vudalik, Officer Robert Wilkins, Amy Paluska, Karen Coldman, Goldman, and Mitchell Waterman to fill out the Bloomfield Youth Services Juvenile Review Board. A second. Any discussions? Yes. Um, I have, um, on two prior occasions, I understand that there needs to be an appointment from the a council liaison to this committee, and I've requested uh, to be appointed to this committee. Uh, and I'm doing so publicly. I would like to be the council liaison to this, this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussions? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? This uh, review board passes. Um, oh, okay. Reports from, <laughs> reports from the town manager. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor and Council, a couple of things. I'd like to remind everybody that the annual uh, uh, budget, uh, annual town and budget meeting is scheduled for May 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, that's at Bloomfield High School, the auditorium. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with Pam Tui, who is the staff person to the state's uh, mm -hmm. crumbling foundation uh, committee. As many of you may know, this is a problem in more in eastern Connecticut. However, we do have one uh, crumbling foundation here in Bloomfield, and our building department uh, will be working uh, on that particular issue with the state uh, as the uh, process uh, pursues ahead. On uh, April uh, 12th, I had the opportunity, along with uh, Deputy Mayor Curtin and Councilman uh, Mann, to attend the senior volunteer uh, reception at the uh, Human Services Facility at 330 Park Avenue. We had a great time uh, uh, serving seniors. I had a rendition from Councilor Mann of a big <laughs> bopper uh, uh, rendition uh, from uh, both of our uh, age cohorts uh, in, in the past. I'd like to also announce that uh, counts, former Councilman Leon Rivers and uh, Joel Newworth were also attendants, uh, in attendance at the, uh, at the volunteer luncheon. And also uh, the Bloomfield Center uh, Business Alliance did meet on April 16th, had a successful meeting, and I think we'll be hearing uh, more <coughs> Uh, from them in the future. That completes my uh, report. Excellent. So um, a couple of things. Um, I had a op wonderful opportunity to uh, be at the Eric D. Coleman Center, the CRT um, students, to read with them for Abuse Prevention Day. It was absolutely amazing. I had the opportunity to read to three classes, and um, it was wonderful. That was a wonderful um, event. I'd also like to thank um, uh, Councillor Mann and his wife and everyone who put time into Earth Day celebrations on Saturday here at 330 Park. It was buzzing with people cleaning up, and, and Councillor Mann and his wife was down on Granby Street um, making Bloom feel beautiful. So I'd like to thank them and everyone else who participated in that event. Um, we're all, I would... Uh, echo the sentiments of the town manager to please everyone come out on May 7th. Um, the council has taken time to go through the budget and we believe that we are being fiscally responsible but we do want our residents to come out and hear, to come out and share your opinion before the budget is totally passed. So please on Monday May 7th at 7 p.m. we will be at the um, uh, Bloomfield High Auditorium, please, please, please come out and let your voices be heard. I also would like to talk about Celebrate Bloomfield. That's coming up. It's going to be um, the weekend of, the weekend of June 2nd. Uh, starting May 31st. We're going to start on May 31st and we're going to go all the way to June 3rd. We have a wonderful lineup of activities. Um, on Friday night, we're going to have the Bloomfield Choir. There's going to be movies on the town green. On Saturday, we're going to have entertainment. We're going to have um, food trucks. Now, if I start talking about the food trucks, we're going to be here for a good long time, but they're good food, right? We're also going to have a craft fair, so we want you to come out. There are going to be restaurants in town that will have a $20.18 special for the week. We're asking you to please come out and enjoy all that Bloomfield has to offer. There will be a fundraising ball on the evening of June 2nd. You're going to hear more about that. All the proceeds will go to services right here in town. We need you all to come out and bloom with us during Celebrate Bloomfield. Okay. Now we're going to uh, approve our minutes from April 16th, our special meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussions? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Carries. Um, the minutes from April 9th? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if Phil got, I know he was away. Um, I was away for that meeting. Um, but I did read the minutes. Um, and I think there was an uh, issue brought up about um, ride-alongs. And I request further information um, because I know that I was the only council person to participate in ride-alongs. Um, and the assertion in um, the minutes was that there was an invasion of privacy. Uh, I know the police officers didn't invade anyone's privacy. And I know me being a part of that ride-along, I didn't invade anyone's privacy. Uh, and so I would like to know um, who is the complainant. And, um, you know, when there is a assertion of evasion of privacy, that is, you know, very, very, um, that's a touchy Philly situation. Um, so I would like to know, um, you know, who were they accusing of um, the evasion of privacy? Um, and so I look forward to that response. Yeah, I'm waiting to hear back from the police department. It related, uh, Ken, to the fact that there's data that comes in on the mobile data terminals and there's also radio transmissions and there's also um, other uh, complaints from the cell phone, the various, let me put it this way, the various communication systems that are going on within a vehicle, a uh, police vehicle at that time. So I'm waiting to hear back from the police department as to, because that's where I received it from as to exactly what the what the situation is. The insurance aspects of it go to the fact that uh, having civilians riding in, in town vehicles, and I know you're a council member and whatnot, but there may be some insurance liability issues if there are any situations that develop because of accidents or, or other things that may be going on. So I'm waiting to get a report back on the insurance uh, uh, aspects of it too. So, um, just to follow up with that, um, there, um, the insurance aspect, I did sign a waiver, there is a waiver, um, on two prior occasions, um, counselors were invited to participate um, in, in the ride-along, uh, one after our orientation um, in November with um, Public Works, um, and then a second one when we toured the police department. Um, third point, um, and um, I'm going to just end this. Um, is that um, that information is freedom of information. Um, so a, a violation of privacy, unless it's a juvenile, um, I can go to the police department right now and say, hey, could I see your police response log for from June 1st to October 22nd? Uh, and they'll publish that. Um, so I just think... Um, I just think it is um, premature, and then we do the Citizens Academy, and we'll allow citizens to do a ride along. So, and I've reached out to every other town, surrounding town, uh, and they participate. Uh, they encourage their uh, council uh, to participate in ride alongs. Um, so, um, I will, um, as chairperson of the Public Safety Committee, continue to request ride alongs, uh, and I would make it public. Um, at every council meeting, if I'm denied, mm -hmm. uh, I see no reason for a council person uh, to be denied a ride along as long as we sign the waiver um, and we're safe. Thank you. Are there any more discussions on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? I'm gonna any abstentions? You weren't here. One abstention. Councilor McClary wasn't here. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to council comments. I'm going to start with Councilor Merritt. I, I don't think I have anything to add to what I've already said tonight. Thank you very much. Excellent. Councilor McCleary. Um, I um, want to thank you. Uh, it's good to be back. I am sorry to the residents of Bloomfield that I took some personal time to take a vacation with my family, but I'm happy to be back. Um, tomorrow I um, will be at 330 Park, um, as I do every Tuesday. Uh, uh, to give out bread to seniors. Uh, if you know anyone who's in need of, of bread, please have them come out um, and participate in it. Um, I give up my lunch break uh, to do so. Uh, and any of the other council members are welcome to join. Uh, I think it will be a, a, a very, very good uh, thing for us to volunteer to give back 
uh, to the residents of Bloomfield. Um, other than that, I was away and I saw that we cut two police cars. Um, I'm concerned with that um, simply because um, there has been a precedent to try to keep up with the fleet of the police um, department. And so over the next couple of weeks, I'll be reaching out to my colleagues to see if we could kind of fund one or two vehicles um, out of our uh, council contingency because what I don't want to happen is next year it becomes four vehicles and then the next year it becomes six vehicles and the next thing you know we have to bond um, a million dollars for vehicles. Uh, so I would like to, for us to keep up with the flow of uh, transition. This is very, very critical infrastructure and um, equipment for our police department. Um, other than that, um, residents of Bloomfield, please come out to the town meeting on the budget and uh, well, provide your feedback. Thank you. <laughs> Council Marshal Neely. Thank you. I just wanted to say to all of the presenters that presented tonight that you did a great job in providing us with information uh, with regard to comments from, from the community. I, I thought that that was uh, very well perceived and you did a good, good job explaining what your concern was. Um, I also would like to make a statement with regard to uh, an event that I, I attended on Friday. I, um, I attend events when I'm invited as a counselor or as someone who wants to come back and help and inform our community with regard to what's going on. So I did attend the event for uh, Dr. Thompson, the superintendent of schools because I believe that I, I was supposed to be there. Uh, I couldn't stay long, but I, I, want, I want to say that some wise person said to me, you never know who's sitting at the table until you're sitting at the table. So I needed to sit at the table at least for a little while. And um, I also requested from the superintendent, I wanted to know what the graduation rate is for our students who graduate from Bloomfield High School and attend college. I wanted to know what the college graduation rate is. The data that I received was not what I was expecting. So I'm still turning under, looking under rocks and turning things over because I need to know whether or not our students are prepared to graduate college, not high school, but college that tells me whether or not we're doing the job that we're supposed to be doing and it shows me that our money is going to the right places um just wanted to thank everyone for your time today and uh and that will be it for me councillor mann thank you madam mayor uh first of all i want to thank the boy scout troop for showing up tonight uh very exciting it's great to see young people who, who are taking upon themselves a role that sort of prepares them better for, for uh, later life. And uh, clearly this is, <laughs> this is an indication of later life right here. And, and the fact that these young kids are, are observing, being uh, put uh, to, to the task of trying to understand what goes on in their community is a wonderful thing. And in that regard, uh, the Earth Day celebration we had uh, on the weekend is another wonderful thing for our community. Yeah, we haven't had an Earth Day or cleanup like we did uh, this weekend for probably 25 years or more. So we're starting this over again because this council believes in community, community helping each other, community making the demonstration of responsibility and so forth. So it was a start and we're gonna to look to grow that every year uh, hereafter and hope that we can get much more uh, cooperation and participation in the community and from some of our commercial entities, many of whom we spent a lot of time picking up their trash. So <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you for, for listening and uh, I'll turn it over to the uh, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I also want to echo um, uh, what Mr. Mann said about the Boy Scouts coming out tonight. I used to be a part of that organization and a lot of good young men there. They do a lot of good work around the community. They volunteer their time. Uh, in addition to that, I also attended uh, the event at the Senior Center to, to recognize all the seniors who volunteer their time around town. And it was a pleasure to serve them. 
uh, interact with them and, and get to know them. They're the bedrock of our community, the seniors. They're the foundation. I just want to thank them for all their service and time that they put into this town. And um, just uh, thank you and have a good evening. So um, in closing, the Boy Scouts, they're, be, they're having a donation drive, a clothing and bottle drive on Saturday, May 12th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. at the Bethel AME Church at 1154 Blue Hills Avenue. Now, a part of Boy Scouts, they get um, points um, for different items, clothing, shoes, bedding, towel, accessories, CDs, DVDs. It's spring. I know she took a long time to come, but I believe she's coming. So we can go ahead and do some spring cleaning, bring it to the Boy Scouts, and help them to get their badges. I thank you for your time. Those who are at home and watching, there's a lot of people watching because I hear feedback. Good, bad, and indifferent. So I thank you for your time, for listening. I thank you to those of you who have actually come out to be a part of this council meeting today. I tell you, the council is doing a lot of work. And I thank the town manager and the town staff for their support. We could not do it without them. I heard a quote today that I want to share. The quote said, become the kind of person you don't mind spending the rest of your life with. <laughs> I leave that for us tonight. Become the kind of person you don't mind spending the rest of your life with. Thank you so very much and good night. Is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor? Motion carries.